we'll talk about a very esoteric topic today which is lagrange multiplier theory and i want to solve the following problem i want to minimize f of x such that h of x is equal to 0 f is a function from rn to r x is in rn h is a function from rn to rm so actually uh, this particular constraint is h1 of x equals to 0 all the way to hm of x equals to 0 so this is the problem that we want to solve Okay, and both both of these functions are differentiable. We have seen some elements of this in the previous few lectures when we talked about a x equal to b. So in those cases, when we say a x equals to b, I can take my h of x to be a x minus b. and i can set it equal to 0 so these are the con this constraint is something that you have seen before but we have only studied the one with linear constraint so far and today i am going to talk about situations when you could have potentially non linear constraints here uh let's look at a very simple example so i want to minimize x1 plus x2 such that x1 square plus x2 square minus 1 equals to 0 so my x is in r2 okay so so far whatever we have done doesn't allow us to solve problems of this type okay so we have a function but this constraint is a non convex set okay because it's just the boundary of a sphere not the sphere itself not the solid sphere so how do we solve it uh i want to i want you to go back to 1750s and 1760s okay so we are no longer in 1960s we are going back in time uh 250 plus years ago uh a mathematician called lagrange was very interested in this he is the same lagrange that you might have studied in your physics courses okay so lagrangian mechanics so he is the same lagrange who's also contributed to the theory of optimization uh so how do we solve it so let's think about it so i have two so i'll i'll draw some some pictures to give you an idea of what we are trying to do so this is my set h1 of x equals to 0 i have another set this is my h2 of x equals to 0 and where do these two sets uh, where do these two surfaces intersect that's this point this is the this is the place where h of x is equal to 0 it's not a convex set it's a non convex set it's just a line in the space and i want to minimize the function f of x i want to minimize the function over this line 
I don't even want to call it a line. I don't know what to call it, a curve, curved line, something like that. So what should we expect the function to satisfy, the gradient of the function to satisfy? So what's the first order necessary condition for optimality? So let's try to think about it. Uh, in the case of optimization over convex sets, we had said that gradient of the function with respect to all feasible directions, it should satisfy the gradient of fx star transpose d must be greater than equal to 0 for all feasible d. Now I'm standing at x star here. I'm going back to this particular space. I'm standing here at x star. But it's a curved surface, okay? It's a curved line. How do I define feasible directions here? What's the way to define feasible directions in this case? Uh, but this is a curved surface, so how do you define A and B? Yes? Like the amount of arc length you travel on it, or like just vary that value? Right. So how do you come up with uh, this direction D, the feasible directions D. Uh, so you are on a curved surface, but remember when we talk about optimality, when we talk about local minima, we are talking about something that is local in nature, not something that is global in nature. So now I'm standing on a curved surface, it's not a convex set. Uh, and I want to come up with something that is local in nature. What should I do? No. I'm looking for feasible directions. What's the feasible direction at that point? Yes? Tangent at that point? Tangent at that point. Good. So we look at feasible directions that are just tangent at this particular point. But how do we define the tangent? So remember that if you look at a surface, the gradient at any point is basically outward normal to the surface. So this will be my gradient of h2 at x star. And this would be my gradient of h1 at x star. Right? So it is basically the gradient is pointing in the direction where the function is going to increase. So this is my h1 of x equals to 0 line. And h1 of x equals to 1 surface is going to be above this surface. So that's why the gradient is pointing upwards. Same thing for h2 of x equals to 0 is this particular surface. But h2 of x equals to 1 is going to be a surface above it. And that's why gradient of h2 is pointing in that particular direction at x star. So this feasible direction d, which is basically a tangent onto this particular curved line at the point x star, that d is going to be orthogonal to both this gradient of h2 as well as the gradient of h1, as you can see here. That tangent is actually orthogonal to both of these gradients. So that leads us to the definition of first order feasible variation. We will denote it by V of x star, which is the set of D in Rn such that gradient of Hi x star transpose D equals to 0 for all i equals 1 to m.
Any questions so far? So I'm looking at the intersection of two surfaces. It gives me a curved line. I look at the tangent at the point x star on the curved line. x star is the point where the function is minimized. x star is the point that is an optimal solution, a local minimum to this particular problem. And I want to figure out how to come up with necessary conditions for optimality. So what are the first order feasible variations? It's basically the set of directions d, which are orthogonal to all of these uh, uh, gradients uh, of these surfaces at x star. So gradient of hi x star transpose d is equal to 0. That's the set of first order feasible variation. Now let's think about what happens if the gradient of, so what about the gradient of the function? So let me draw the same line again. So I'm not going to draw the surface. So this is my line. I'm magnifying it. This is my x star. This is my direction d. And gradient of h1, gradient of h2 at x star. Where do you think gradient of fx star is going to lie? So let's think about it. Let's assume, so imagine a plane, imagine a plane spanned by the gradient of h1 and gradient of h1 and gradient of h2 at this particular location. So that's just going to be a plane, a hyperplane, which is basically the set of all vectors spanned by the gradient of h1 and gradient of h2 at x star. Okay, so that's a plane that is intersecting at this particular line, at this particular point x star. I am going to claim that the gradient of f is going to actually lie on that particular plane. Why should that be the case? Well, if the gradient of f is not lying in the plane, if the gradient of f is moving away from the plane, okay, so we have a plane like this, and I am saying that the gradient of f is going to be like this. If that is the case, then if I move myself a little bit on this side, I am going to reduce the uh, reduce my reduce the value of the function, right? So that's going to contradict with the fact that x star is a local minimum. So that's why I think, or I'm claiming that actually the gradient of f is going to be in the plane itself. Okay. So that's roughly what Lagrange multiplier theorem says. Uh, I have to define another thing, which is regularity. X is regular if gradient H1 of X, gradient HM of X are linearly independent. Okay, so the necessary condition for optimality says I'm going to erase this also. x star is a local minimum and a regular point
implies there exists lambda star in R m such that gradient of f at x star plus summation transpose second derivative Okay, so this is my line h of x equals to 0, this is my gradient of h1 and this is my gradient of h2 and I am saying and this is the plane that is spanned by these two gradients at point x star and I am saying that my function gradient of f at x star actually lies on this plane. So what is the way to say that it lies on this plane? Well, it is actually a linear combination of the gradients that the two gradients that we have here and so the linear combination of the gradients is basically summation of lambda i star gradient of h i x star and the gradient of f can be written as linear combination of the gradient of h and that is what is meant by the first statement of the theorem. Well, so lambda i star can take positive or negative value, so it does not matter. It will matter when we have inequality constraint, but we will get to it in a bit, sometime. Any other question? Yes. Yeah, so if, if, the, if this was my plane, so this is my plane, and my gradient of f is pointing in some other direction, not, not on this plane, so it is pointing in other direction. It means that if I slide from this point x star, if I move in this particular direction, my function value is going to reduce, okay? Because the gradient is pointing in this particular direction, which means that moving in this direction is going to reduce my gradient. Sorry? Um, or maybe in the opposite direction, in the negative gradient direction. So if, if the gradient, uh, I'm trying to see, okay. I'm going to look at this curve from here, okay. So I'm, 
this is my eye right here and I'm going to look at this curve. So the curve is going to look something like this. This is my curve, this is my point x star. Uh, this plane is basically, it's just going to look like a line like this because you are, you are looking at it from the front. Now if you claim that your gradient of f x star is not on this plane, then I'm going to, so this is my negative of gradient of f x star. And so if I move in this direction, I'm going to reduce the value of the function because I'm moving, sorry, this is the negative, that's the positive. So if I'm, if this side is where the negative of the gradient is, I can actually slide along this side and I can reduce the value of the function by moving along this line. So why is that not allowed? Why? Why is that not allowed? No, I'm just saying that, so the question was, why should the gradient lie in this plane? So I'm assuming that the gradient is not lying in the plane, and then I'm claiming that x star is not a local minimum. I, because I can slide in this line and I can reduce the value of the function. Okay? So, okay? so there is a projection of the negative gradient. Uh, what do you mean by projection of the negative? The Oh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, so you can think of it as projection, but projection typically involves a convex set, but we don't really have a convex set. Uh, but you are kind of projecting the negative gradient onto the, onto the curved line. But this is okay. just supposing that the gradient is not on the plane. Not on the plane. So the gradient mass down the plane. Sorry? So the gradient mass down the plane. Must be on the plane. If it is an optimal solution, if x star is a local minimum, then the gradient must be on the plane. If x star is not a local minimum, then I can, then the gradient may not be on the plane and then I can move in the direction of negative gradient and get to x star. How can we converge then if we have a non-zero gradient? How can we converge? Yeah. In what sense? Like, why do you want to converge? What's the sequence that you are generating? Okay. Uh, yeah, I I didn't quite get what the question was. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's the first part. The second part is saying that okay, if I'm going to look at the first order feasible variation, then this matrix, the second derivative of f plus lambda i star second derivative of h. So this is this looks like positive definite matrix, like D transpose second derivative times D is non-negative, but it's not positive definite in all directions. All we require is to be positive definite on this particular plane. So what is V of X star? V of X star is all the vectors on this plane. No, uh, sorry, not, that is not V of X star. V of X star is this. So this is my, yeah, this is the hyperplane uh, spanned by, and V of X star is basically all the tangents to this particular, this is my V of X star. So along this particular direction, I want this particular matrix to be positive semi-definite. I'm, again, I'm saying positive semi-definite, but I don't really mean positive semi-definite. You can have negative eigenvalues for this symmetric matrix, but D transpose this matrix D has to be non-negative for all D which are tangent to this curved line, which is my H of X equals to zero line. So this is the second order necessary condition for optimality. So this is the first order necessary condition, this is the second order necessary conditions for optimality. V of x star is first order feasible variation. So you're sitting at x star, you're looking at this surface h of x equals to zero or a curve h of x equals to zero, 
V of x star is basically all the tangents to this surface at x star. So the tangents are in this direction and in this direction. Yeah, that's this line, this curved line. Not uh, uh, right. So, so uh, it's, it's the intersection of tangents of all h of x. So basically, it is tangent to this particular curve. It's moving in this direction and it's moving in this direction. There are two curves, right? There are two curves, correct. So you have two tangents. Uh, so there are actually three curves. There is h1 of x equals to 0, there is h2 of x equals to 0, and then there is h of x equals to 0. H of x equals 0 is just the intersection of the two. So why would we have three tangents? Uh, so are you talking about the tangent? At x star. At x star? So for h1 of x, the tangent will be completely different. For h2 of x, it will be completely different. But the intersection is non-empty. And I'm talking about the intersection of the two tangent sets. So let me, uh, yeah, let me, draw, let me draw it individually so that you can imagine what the tangent curve looks like. So I have. This is my h of x, h1 of x equals to 0. And if I'm sitting at x star, my tangent plane is going to look like all these directions. Uh, so uh, that's how you might have studied it in undergrad. But, but in grad school, tangent actually is a plane. It's, I mean, it's called a tangent plane. It's not really a line. Uh, because in n dimensions, your tangent could be n dimensional big. Or it could be like n, n minus 1 dimensional plane in an n dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So that's what is happening here. So there is a tangent plane like this. And then there is a tangent plane for h2, which is intersecting with this tangent plane. Mm -hmm. And the intersection of those two tangent plane is going to be a uh, v of x star. And which is basically this line here in this particular figure. That's a lot of geometry in one class. <laughs> but uh, that's the only way to visualize this. OK. Any other question? Uh, the intuition comes from the proof, but I'm really debating, my, debating in my mind whether I should be doing proof in the class or not, because the proof is going to span two lectures. <laughs> uh, I think lambda, uh, lambda is sort of too big a scalar, but it's lambda. So you have as many lambdas as you have the number of constraints. Okay, so for each constraint you have a lambda i star, and so that's how you define it. Okay, let's do some examples. So I want to minimize, uh, let's do a simple example. I want to minimize x1 square plus 3x2 square such that x1 plus x2 equals to 1. So this is my f of x, and this is my h of x equals to 0. So f of x 
x1 square plus 3 x2 square and h of x x1 plus x2 minus 1. Okay, so at x star, so first of all, I need to check whether it's a regular point or not. So what is gradient of h at x? What's the gradient here? No, that's gradient of f, just 1, 1. So for every x, the gradient of h of x is 1, 1. So it's not equal to 0. This is a regular point. In fact, all points are regular. So I think the, the regularity is satisfied at all points in this particular case. So I'm going to erase this. You have only one edge, but it doesn't vanish anywhere. So gradient of h1, h2, h3, all of them have to be linearly independent of each other. But if you have only one gradient, then it should not be 0. Then it means that you have a valid, uh, it, you have a regular point. Okay. Can you just give an example of an irregular point? Uh, right, perfect. I'll give you an example of an irregular point. It'll be. So it's when two surfaces are tangent to each other, that's when you get an irregular point. So I have a so both the gradients are pointing in the same direction. Okay, so the two surfaces are actually just touching each other at a point, then in that case it's an irregular point. Because the two gradients are linearly independent linearly dependent. And then delta H1, delta H2 are the same. In this case, it is the same. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, it could be pointing in opposite direction. Uh, I don't know. Like if I make a if I make a circle like this, and this gradient is in this direction for this circle, and this gradient. So even then, it's linearly dependent. Okay. So these are the cases which are prevented by this condition. But these are anyways degenerate examples. Okay, so important thing, if you go to MATLAB as a software engineer and you are writing code, you cannot assume that the person who's giving you the input function is checking for regularity or not checking for regularity, right? So there it's a bit complicated because if you're writing a solver for general purpose, uh, somehow you need to check for regularity as well, or if it is not regular, then somehow you have to throw an exception to the user that look, there seems to be something wrong with your optimization problem. However, if you're solving problem in, I don't know, biology or physics or wireless systems, it's quite likely that you will have regular points, like all points are gonna be regular points because you don't get to see these degenerate systems in those situations. Okay, so we have checked for regularity. All points are regular in this case. Uh, now I want to use this first order necessary condition for optimality to find the optimal solution here. So, gradient f of x star plus, oh, there is only one lambda star. Gradient h of x star equals to zero. So I have two x1 star, six x2 star plus lambda star, lambda star equals to zero. Oh, so I have, I have three unknowns, but I only have two equations. How do I solve it? I have three unknowns. I don't know x1 star, I don't know x2 star, I don't know lambda star. 
So I have three unknowns and I have two equations. Hx star equals to zero. X1 star plus X2 star minus one equals to zero. So now I have three equations, three unknowns. Okay, now I can solve it. So going back to this expression, so my x star is unknown, my lambda star is unknown, so I have m plus n unknown quantities. So you get n equalities here, and you get m equalities here, and that's how you get like n plus m unknowns and n plus m equations. Okay, so we got like n plus m unknowns and n plus m equations here. So let's try to solve it. My x1 star, what is it equal to? Minus lambda star over two. My x2 star minus lambda star over six. So I'm going to substitute this here. So I get minus lambda star over two minus lambda star over six minus one equals to zero. What do I get? Does this look correct? I think it is correct. So I get this. I get this. So I get x1 star equals to Three over four, x two star equals to one over four, and lambda star equals to minus two x one star. Oh, lambda star I've already figured out minus three over two. So that's the optimal solution. Well, it's a candidate for an optimal solution because it satisfies first order necessary condition for optimality. So it's a candidate for local minimum. Uh, does it satisfy this condition? Second condition? Let's check. Let me write it here. So what's my gradient second derivative at x star? One zero zero three. So is this condition satisfied? Is the second condition satisfied? Why is it satisfied? Sorry? Uh, so this one is positive definite matrix. This one is a zero matrix. So D transpose positive definite matrix D is always non-negative, right? So it's certainly non-negative for all D in Vx star. Therefore, uh, it satisfies the second order condition as well, second order necessary condition as well. So it's highly likely that this is the optimal solution, and this one is the corresponding Lagrange multiplier pair, corresponding Lagrange multiplier. Uh, how do we know that this is the optimal solution, not just a candidate? Should be positive definite rather than semi-positive? Just against this. Kind of. <laughs> that is the sufficient condition for optimality for this case. 
So, but I have not talked about sufficient conditions yet, so we'll talk about it in a bit. Okay, let's look at a, another example right after this and see what happens in that example. Any questions on this? Um, yes. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so second derivative is two zero zero six, but it's still positive definite. Okay. Any other question? So, this automatically satisfies the second condition. Yes. Yes. Delta h square is zero. Right. Uh, D is any vector. D is an Rn. D is an Rn. We'll see. We'll see the next example. We haven't proved it because it's automatically satisfied because the function f is uh, quadratic and the constraint is linear. So this is zero. And this is the positive definite matrix. OK. So in this case, it's automatically satisfied. But let's look at the second situation, second problem, where we will have more trouble and we'll spend more time. OK. So I'm going to erase this side. OK. I want to minimize x1 plus x2 such that x1 square plus 3 x2 square minus 1 equals to 0. Now I've made it complicated. So my constraint has quadratic terms. So what am I doing here? So I have an ellipsoid. This is my h of x equals to 0. And I'm trying to find x1 and x2 such that the sum is minimized. OK, that's what I'm trying to do. Why were they interested in these kind of problems? Why are we interested in these kind of problems? Like, why were they interested 200 years ago? What was the motivation? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I think uh, they weren't making rockets for sure. Uh, I think they were studying planet, planets and they kind of figured out, I'm not very sure by the way, so I'm just hypothesizing based on my own knowledge of Wikipedia, from Wikipedia and other sources. So I think what they were interested is in figuring out um, how planets move because somehow planets are connected to your luck and so if you are going for a war, you need to know if planets are aligned for, <laughs> for your kingdom or not. So they, they were very interested in figuring out how planets are moving. And it led to the calculus of variations. And I'm not quite sure how the optimization came in. But I think in classical mechanics, which I've never studied in physics, uh, they do some path integral and they are trying to like they, they say that the planets or whatever celestial not celestial any body under the influence of force or whatever is minimizing Lagrangian or something like I don't know in classical physics they study in that particular manner and so I think those were the kind of problems they were studying and they were interested in these kind of issues. Uh, one thing I will note is Lagrange did not prove this specific result. So he actually was more interested in minimizing over trajectories, not Rn. Okay, so what's the minimal trajectory that the planets are going to follow? Yeah, I, I completely like classical mechanics is something I haven't studied. But uh, basically, he was interested in figuring out. Uh, how the planets are going to move and that 
somehow x was a trajectory, not just a specific point in the space Rn. It was actually a time series. And uh, I don't know where the constraints emerged from, but there was some function that they were minimizing subject to constraints. And there's this whole field of calculus of variation. So all of this stuff, the birth of it actually came from calculus of variations. OK. Uh, so, so this is the problem. So now my gradient of, so what about gradient of h at x? This is 2x1 and 6x2. Is this a regular point? Where will this be not regular point? When x1 and x2, both of them are simultaneously 0. But on this curve, is x1 and x2 simultaneously 0? No, it cannot be, because that's the origin. So origin doesn't lie on the set itself. Origin doesn't lie on hx equals to 0. So all points are regular points. OK? So all points are regular. OK, so I can apply the Lagrange multiplier theorem. So x star is a minimum. So gradient of f at x star plus lambda star gradient of h at x star 1, 1 plus 2 x1 star lambda star 6 x2 star lambda star equals to 0. So what do I get? x1 star equals to minus 1 over 2 lambda star x2 star equals to minus 1 over 6 lambda star. OK, so now I need to plug this equation into the constraint set in order to get the value of lambda star. So I have 1 over 4 lambda star square plus 3 over 36 lambda star equals to 1 square. Am I doing this correctly? OK. So I have 1 over 4 plus 1 over 12. How much is this? 3 plus 1, 4. Yeah, 1 over 3. Okay, so now I have two lambda stars. I have two potential values of lambda star. So which one is the correct lambda star? Great. Let's do that. So let's try to verify the second order condition. And I need to remove something. So what what should I remove? Okay, here is what I'll do. x1 star equals to minus 1 over 2 lambda star. x2 star equals to. So now I can erase all of this. What is my V of x star? 
this is the set of all D such that gradient of H at X star transpose T equals to 0, which is basically D such that 2 X 1 D 1, 6 Awesome. Then second derivative of f at x star zero 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 zero. What's the second derivative? Two zero zero six. So I want D transpose lambda i lambda star second derivative of H at X star D to be non-negative. This is positive definite. And lambda can take either a positive value or a negative value. It has to take the positive value for this to be a satisfy the second order necessary condition. So let's pick lambda star equals to plus square root 1 over 3. So then this whole thing is a positive definite matrix. Then D transpose this D is going to be greater than or equal to 0 for all D in this set. And then for this value of lambda star, I can get x1 star and x2 star. And that's a candidate optimal solution, OK? The way to prove that this is an optimal solution, we need to check the second order sufficiency condition. The sufficient conditions, we'll do that in the next class, OK? But that's how we find out whether uh, we have a potential optimal solution or not in this particular case. And that proves that x1, x2 star is a goal minimizer? It will turn out that it's a global minimum in this case uh, because the, no, I, I, it is a global minimum. Let's talk about it in the next class because we are out of time right now. Uh, we just have one minute. Uh, but basically, in this case, it's a global minimum. We'll do that. Uh, we'll prove that by visual inspection. But there is no way to prove it by just invoking convexity or something because nothing is convex in this. Well. Yeah, the function is convex, but because it's x1 plus x2, so it's by default convex. But the constraint set is actually non-convex. So we can't really appeal to the usual stuff to show that this is an optimal solution. So this theorem is, the Lagrange multiplier theorem is good for finding the local. Just for local, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so in the next class, we'll talk about sufficient conditions for optimality. And we'll check that this satisfies sufficient conditions for optimality. And therefore, it's a local minimum of the function at hx equals to 0. Thank you.